Hello, everyone, and welcome to this webinar organized by DocCity in partnership with Swiss Education Group. My name is Alessandra. It's a pleasure to meet all of you, and I will be moderating this event on behalf of DocCity today. So I see here that our first participants have started to join us. Welcome, everyone. Uh, we are just going to wait a few minutes before we start um, our session to make sure that everyone has a chance to connect and be ready for the presentation. But in the meantime, don't hesitate to say hi or introduce your, um, yourself in the chat because we are curious to know where you're joining us from. So if you want, please take a moment to share your location. So I want to introduce you all uh, to our panelists for today. Uh, today with us, we have uh, Dr. Jorge Arnanz, the Assistant Dean at Swiss Education Group, and also Gaia Cantamessa, who will help us during the Q&A session. So together with them, we're going to discover more about the Master of Science in Leadership at uh, Cesar Ritz College in Switzerland, and we will get an insight of their premium education that will open doors to managerial careers in various sectors beyond hospitality, such as retail, consulting, and finance. And you will also have the opportunity to uh, interact with our speakers and ask all your questions live. So talking about that, I would like to remind you that after the presentation, we will have a Q&A session where you will be able to ask all your questions to um, our panelists. So don't be shy. You just have to type all your questions in the Q&A box that you see here on Zoom, and we will go, uh, we will go through them at the end of the webinar. Um, another little piece of information for those of you interested in receiving a certificate of attendance by DocCity for this free webinar, stay tuned because we will be posting the link to get the certificate at the end of the Q&A session. So I can see here that some more people have joined us. Welcome to those who just joined. And I think that we are able to start now. So without further ado, I'm now leaving the floor to our panelist uh, for his presentation. So uh, Dr. Arnanz, the floor is yours. And um, see you in a bit and enjoy. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, and uh, welcome everybody. Uh, I don't know uh, where you are located, so I would say good evening. That I, It's a good evening now here in, in Switzerland. Maybe good afternoon to some of you and maybe good morning. Uh, so uh, as uh, Alexandra introduced, I am the assistant dean for Cesar Ritz College uh, in Switzerland, part of the Swiss Education Group. And the purpose of the webinar is uh, not to talk too much about the Master of Science that we are offering, but I want you to be familiar with the kind of uh, information and materials and uh, activities that we do with uh, our students in this, uh, in this program. Uh, today I have prepared a small master class in which we're going to talk about the importance of leadership uh, in the hospitality industry, as you know, as you can, you can know, Cesar Ritz uh, Colleges is mainly a hospitality school, but we are focusing on uh, business management as well. So we're going to see the importance of lead, leading people uh, also uh, from the hospitality industry or from any of the uh, industries in the service sector. I believe uh, my colleague uh, Gaia, who is also here, uh, will be able to share more information and or will be helping me at the end of the of the presentation with some uh, of the questions and answers. So, Kaya, if you want just to introduce yourself very quickly as well. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Jorge. Um, good evening, morning and afternoon, uh, everyone. And thank you for, for joining us here today. Um, just before... Um, Passing uh, the ball to, to Jorge, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Gaia Cantamessa. I am part of the admissions team at Caesar Reeds uh, College, Switzerland. So I will be more than happy to answer any questions that you have in terms of enrollments, admission procedure, and all of that after the presentation. If you do have any questions regarding this, or I am also available to uh, connect directly with you in the coming days and weeks, should you have any questions then. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you, Jorge, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. So I will share my screen now. Oh, 
Okay, can you see the full screen now? Yes. Okay, so um, as we were mentioning in uh, Cesar Ridge Colleges, uh, we have a program that is uh, now uh, starting this coming October, that is a Master of Science in Leadership. Actually, uh, Master of Science is a new program that we are opening in our school because we were just uh, accredited uh, by the Swiss federal government, meaning that we have become now, even if our name is still Cesar Rich Colleges, we are now a University of Applied Science and we can offer to our students a Master's of Science and Bachelor of Science. So we're going to have the two new programs starting in, the, uh, in October term. Uh, for the Master of Science is a special program uh, that we have created in a way that we believe that leadership, as is a Master of Science in leadership, it doesn't come much from, from the coursework and from the theory that you le learn uh, in school and university and in the Master's, but more from uh, the experience that you get and also from the soft skills that you will get. One of the main uh, assets that you will have as leaders of the future is the soft skills. Because at the end of the day, as I'm saying here in my presentation, uh, when we are leaders, when we become leaders, we are leading people. We are uh, collaborating with people. And in order to uh, have this uh, effective collaboration and effective uh, uh, teamwork with other people, we need to work a lot on our soft skills. Uh, this presentation, uh, here I'm not going to give much information about the Master of Science because the Master of Science, you have all the information you need on the website, but I want to have kind of an introduction to leadership and how the perspective of uh, people-centric leadership is important for us. So the topics that we're going to cover today in these next uh, 35 minutes it will be about what is leadership, about the difference between leadership and managers, about what would be the main characteristics of effective leaders, and finally talking about emotional intelligence, which is one of the important uh, soft skills that we are working on in the masters by doing different activities, not just in the classroom. So uh, I know that you cannot answer by voice, but if any of you can give me an idea or some short definition of what do you consider leadership is, or maybe some uh, words, uh, some keywords that are related to leadership before I give you my definition. Let me see if I can see the, the chat. Okay, someone says about listening, good. Anything else? Leadership is about listening. Of course, leaders, listening is part of communication and communication is one of the important skills you need to master in order to be a good leader. Anything else? Nothing else? Okay, in this case, I will continue with the presentation. I will show you the definition. This definition comes from one of the authors. Inspiration, good. Inspiring people. Uh, not to be, uh, sorry, not to be his state about a decision. Good. It's about, uh, again, all of this information you are talking, I like the one of inspiration because in my definition, you will see that there's a verb uh, that is similar to inspiring, also not doubting, not hesitating about decisions. Actually, uh, we will say that uh, leaders is not about having all the answers or knowing how to make decisions all the time, but sometimes it's about knowing who can get the right answer as well. Again, it's related to people, knowing people, relating to people, interacting with people. Good. So now I will give you this definition that comes from uh, some authors in the book that you can see here. I took this definition from. And it says that leadership is the influencing process of leaders and followers to achieve organizational objectives through change. And I have put in bold some words because I think those are the five key components of leadership. There's only one verb in the whole definition that is influencing. It's related to what Ivana said about inspiration. So we have to influence people, but not just the managers influencing the employees, 
but also we need to get employees to influence managers. Everyone can be a leader in some specific point. We have leaders and followers, we have the organizational objectives, and very important in the times that we are living, we have the world change. So we're gonna go very quickly through all of these five components. When we talk about leaders and followers, we were talking about uh, two different type of people, but again, it's the importance of people-centric uh, leadership. This should be a two-way process. If we think of leadership or management from the old style, it would be only a one way. The leader or the manager say something and the followers just follow or just do whatever the person in charge does. However, in the new definitions of leadership, we always see it as a two-way process. Everyone can influence each other. The leaders will influence the followers, but the followers will also influence the leaders. A leader is a person, this is very important, not all the leaders need to be managers. Manager is a position that is given to you by the company, but it, does, it doesn't mean that if you don't have the management title in your uh, pocket, it doesn't mean you cannot be a leader. Leaders can be managers or non managers, but the important thing is that they have the ability to influence other people. And again, the followers would be the people who are influenced by the leader. Influence, the verb that we saw, is the process from a leader to communicate ideas and to get them accepted. Not just to make them people, make people follow your ideas only because they are scared of getting negative consequences, but it's more about a process of communication and a process of acceptance. And also related to uh, what we were saying, communication involves listening, also motivating, inspiring followers. It's something very important. And most of the time, uh, this uh, implementation of new ideas would be through change. And change is something that was also in the definition. The objectives of the organization is something that should be in the middle of the leadership process. And we need to think not just of the interest of ourselves, not just of the interest of the leaders, the interest of the followers, but also the interest of the organization. In order to be an effective leader, we need to make sure that the way we influence followers, it's always ethical and beneficial. If it's not ethical, the followers will follow us only because they have some interest. For example, they want to get the salary, they don't want to get fired, uh, they want to get a promotion, but it, this doesn't mean that they are uh, positively influenced by us. When we are ethical, when we think of the benefits for the company, for the followers, and for us, this is the proper way of influencing and the proper way of leading. The, in order to set proper objectives, they need to be specific and difficult. Difficult might sound something strange that I tell you that you need to set difficult objectives. The, I can change the word difficult for challenging. If it's an objective that is too easy, it's not going to motivate people because it's something that they can get very easily in any moment. You need to do something that is difficult enough, but also achievable. So this is part of the definition of leadership as well. That's why we need to influence our followers in order to get these organizational objectives. But we need to be effective when designing the objective as well. Change, organization need to continually change, especially in the global environment we are living now, in the period of globalization. And also if we talk about the hospitality industry, the service industry, it's an industry that keeps changing every single day. The most important part of this definition is about people. Leadership is about people. If you are someone who works alone, on your own, only with a computer, you cannot be a leader. In order to be a leader, you need to influence. You don't influence machines, you influence people. So that's why people is the central part of this definition. We need to treat people as assets that we have in our organization and that they are very important for the financial success of the organization. Now I have another question for you. Do you think leaders, after seeing the definition of leadership, a very broad definition of leadership, but with five key components, do you think leaders are born or they can be made? People are born to be a leader 
or you can turn almost anyone into a leader. What do you think? You can just write born or made or both of them. They can be made, good. Sometimes both of them, good. Sometimes we hear the expression a natural born leader, someone who has some specific characteristics that make them be more prone or more likely to become a leader. But yes, I agree with you, they can be made. And again, you can have more advantages if you are born with one, some set of skills that can, can, can come to you genetically, for example, or can come from your culture, from your family background as well. But again, of course, if you work hard enough, you can be made a leader. So yes, most researchers agree with you, say that the answer is both. Some people are born with some natural ability and then they need to develop it. You cannot just be born with some ability and just leave it be and then become a leader only because of that, because of the genetical uh, predisposition. Some are developed through effort and hard work. Uh, we have many cases of people that at the beginning of their studies, they are not good at public speaking. And the more we do public speaking, they become more comfortable. And then at the end of the day, at the end of their degree, they can become very good speakers. This is all done through effort and hard work. There's other people that they are natural public speakers and they are okay talking in front of hundreds of people without feeling shy or without getting nervous as well. So that's why it would be a combination of both of them. All people have potential leadership skills. So any of our employees has the possibility to become a leader. Leader at different scales. Again, we are not equating leaders and managers, but leaders is people who can influence other people. That's why organizations spend millions of dollars every year to develop the leadership skills of their employees. If the answer was no, only someone who is born with these particular skills can be a leader, then why are those organizations spending money if they thought that way? Okay, so the answer, correct answer would be a bit of both. When we talk about the difference that we saw a bit before, a leader can be a manager or can be someone who doesn't have a management position. In the past, we used to talk more about management than about leadership. Management, it was more about the actual actions related to managing a business. Now we are talking more about leadership, also because of that focus on people that is becoming more common in every single industry and in every single part of the world. So we can say that the paradigm, the theories are changing from focusing on management to focusing on leadership. Successful managers, they are becoming more democratic and they are sharing these uh, different responsibilities with the employees in order to succeed. People, they need to understand that you can be very good, but you're not, not going to be the best at everything. And you need to use your pool of employees to help you leading the company. Here, the next one, I have a slide in which we can see differences between managers and leaders. Managers administer a business. Leaders innovate. So administer is just doing the basic task to make it successful, operating the business, we can say. Innovating is coming with new ideas and with creative ideas. Managers maintain what is already there and leaders develop. So managers keep the assets and keep the strengths that the company have and try to maintain those advantages. But leaders try to develop and to work on those strengths to find new ways of doing things. Managers in the old style, they would be more controlling employees, while leaders try to inspire employees. That this is one of the words that you mentioned before. Managers, they would be more focused on the short term, while leaders will be focused more on the long term. The managers will ask you how and when things need to be done. However, the leaders will ask you what and why. The difference between these questions, how and when and what and why, is that what and why show more of a critical thinking. So it's not just uh, what do I need to do to make my organization successful, but when someone asks me, you need to do this, you ask why. You need to understand why this needs to be done. You are not refuting that, that person, 
but you want to understand why things need to be done in order to decide if this is the best way of acting or there could be different ways. Managers kind of follow what has been done before. That's why we say they imitate or they accept the status quo. The status quo is the things that have been done the same way for a long time. And when we ask why things have been done this way in the company for 10 years, and they say, I don't know, there's always been there. They have always been like this. I will continue doing them like this. However, the leaders, they do something different. They originate, they create new ways of doing things and new ideas and they challenge that status quo. If someone tells them, ah, oh, we are doing this this way, we have this process in our organization because it has been like this for our whole life. And then they will ask, yes, but now life is different. 10 years ago, we didn't have the same advances, the same technologies as we have now. Maybe it's the moment to rethink things. The last one, managers do things right. So they, we can say that they try to follow the rules of what has been uh, put in the paper for them, while the leaders do the right things, do whatever needs to be done in order to reach the organizational goals, in order to motivate their employees, etc. So as a summary of this uh, topic that we were talking about, leadership, the difference between leaders and managers, we can say that nowadays an effective leader, it would be someone who serves leadership responsibilities through co-leadership. In the past, a manager would try to keep all the leadership or all the management tasks with them. They will delegate in some uh, aspects, in some tasks, but not in those that are involving management activities or leadership activities. They usually wanted to, uh, wanted to uh, get the power for themselves. Now we realize that if our purpose is influencing people, our purpose is changing, our person, purpose is reaching their organizational objectives, the best way is to share leadership and to have other people helping you leading the organization. Effective leaders, they also teach leadership skills to their subordinates. So this is related to the first one. If you want to share their leadership responsibilities, you need to make sure that your followers are ready to be leaders as well. So you need to teach them leadership skills. Effective leaders influence followers to support organizational interest. So one of the influences or the inspiration we need to pass to our followers is the importance of their organizational objectives. It's not just uh, having them thinking what is going to be good for my career, what is going to be good for my family. Also thinking that the better the organization goes, the better it's going to be for the individuals working for the organization. So this is something that needs to be transmitted to the followers as well. Effective leaders set objectives and set objectives that they are smart objectives, that they can be uh, difficult, but they can be, uh, they can be achievable and that they are challenging for the employees. Effective leaders influence change for continual improvement. There's not going to be one single moment in which one effective leader will say, okay, now we reach it. Now we are happy with, what, with our uh, success. We are happy with our achievements. That's it. I'm going to stop now. We can have one year of continuing and living out of the fruits of whatever, whatever we got. Because if you do that in one year, you're going to be, if you were number one, you're going to be number 10 or number 100. Because the other companies, especially in this competitive uh, global uh, atmosphere that we are living, there's going to be, there's always going to be people looking for innovations and for change. And very important, and this is the main purpose of this presentation, effective leaders can work with people. Can work with people, it doesn't mean have the ability to work with people, it can work well with people. Can we work, uh, they can work, sorry, in a, a relationship based and in a, in a relationship focused uh, leadership style. So this is the most important part and this is what is gonna connect with our next uh, part of the presentation, the second part of the presentation, that is talking about emotional intelligence. Have you heard about emotional intelligence before? Have you heard of this before? Yes? 
And can you explain in very easy words what is emotional intelligence? In the past, when we talked about intelligence, when we said this person is very intelligent many years ago, uh, we would think only about the IQ, right? This person has a very high IQ. It has a very high level of understanding of things. However, here we have some questions about the other side of the intelligence, not just the IQ, but the EQ, that is the emotional intelligence. I see that uh, someone say knowing how people react. Good. Another one, when you influence emotion and emotions of other people. Good. It's not just about influencing, but it's also about knowing. We will see that there are four main components of uh, emotional intelligence. Two of them is about awareness and two of them are about management. So we need to be aware about something before we can act on something. But yes, you are right. You are on the right position. Again, we put people in the middle. You put someone mentioned about emotion, uh, not influencing, but managing, managing your own emotions. Okay, then we have also empathy. Good. Empathy is one of the components of the emotional intelligence, as we will see now. If we want to do it very easy, if we want to have a very uh, straightforward uh, definition of what is emotional intelligence, is the ability to understand, to recognize, and to understand emotions. Number one, you need to recognize, you need to understand the emotions, not just your own emotions, but the emotions of other people. And then you need to use this awareness, once you are aware of the emotions of different people and your own emotions, you need to manage those emotions for yourself and those emotions for other people in your relationships with others. Good. So I think you were very much on track with these definitions. So do you know the names of the four components of emotional intelligence? Related to awareness, related to management. I don't know if you have studied this before. If not, we can see it now in the next slide. You see, we have self-awareness and social awareness. This is about what we were saying, recognizing and understanding. Self-awareness, so this is based on what I see. What I see, not only with my eyes, it's what, what, what I perceive. What do I perceive about myself? That is my self-awareness. When talking about mainly about emotions. What do I perceive about other people? That is, uh, that is focused on their social competence. Uh, competence. That is the, my social awareness. Once I recognize and understand my own feelings and emotions, I need to manage them. I need to know my actions and my behaviors, how they are going to be affected by my own emotions. So this is what we call self-management, and this is related to the actions, to what I do. Once I'm able to understand myself and manage myself, I need to go one level higher. That it's trying to do the, the, the same, the same action, but with other people, social awareness. I need to recognize the emotions of people and I need to try to understand them. And trying to understand them is one of the most difficult points because uh, nowadays we are involved, we are collaborating, we are working with people from many different backgrounds. In the past, this, uh, uh, these slides would be, or this, uh, um, this information and this, this action of social awareness would be something easier because in the past, uh, you would be working with people from a similar background, people from your own nationality, people living in the same city as you, that would be the common uh, situation in most of the organizations. Now in the same organization, if I talk about the classes that I teach at my university, sometimes we are 15 people and including me, we have 14 nationalities and we are people from different ages and we are people from different genders, people from different religions. So that's why the emotions and the feelings, we need to be able to understand them, even if they are totally different to the way I feel or the way I perceive emotions. So social awareness, it's a very important part. And this is related to uh, what Sandra said about empathy. Empathy is one big example of social awareness. 
after I am able to do this difficult task that is understanding the feelings of other people and uh, well, first perceiving them and second, understanding them, I need to be able to manage them and to manage my, uh, my relationships. So we're going to go uh, very quickly through each of them and we're going to do a very quick practical exercise about your self-awareness to see how good and how in tune are you with your own emotions. Self-awareness, we have here a short definition, is the ability to perceive your own emotions. You need to stay aware of your emotions as they happen. So this is kind of a task that you need, we need to put to ourselves. We need to, every time my emotions change, I need to realize that my emotions have changed. You don't need to take a notebook and write it down, but you need to be aware every time your emotions change and you need to understand why they are changing. You need to keep on top of how you tend to respond to specific situations and to specific people. How specific situations affect your emotions. How specific people and their behavior affect your emotions as well. So all of these three things are related to self-awareness. Thomas Carlyle, who was a philosopher, a Scottish philosopher from the 18th century, he said that the, great, the greatest of faults is to be conscious of none. When you say, I don't have any fault, it means that that is a big, a big fault that you have because you should be aware of what are your limitations and your faults. How do we work and how do we improve our self-awareness? First, we need to know ourselves. And knowing yourself, it sounds something easy, but actually, in order to know yourself from an emotional point of view, you need to do some homework. You need to see yourself for who you are. You need to know and understand what you do, what you think, what you feel. You need to watch your emotions like a hawk. Place your eyes always on your emotions. Any sign of a change of emotion, you need to understand. Now I'm feeling angry. Why is it? Now I'm feeling stressed. Why is it? What changed from one hour ago that I was in stress until now that I'm stressed? The best and the more you, the more time, the longer time you spend on asking yourself these questions, it will be the better uh, for this uh, self-awareness. Try to track and backtrack your emotions in a difficult conversation or meeting. Try to learn your uh, tendencies when you are having some situations that are creating a lot of emotional uh, responses on you. Sometimes you can use someone to help you with this, a friend, a, per, a peer, a supervisor, to ask him or her how he feels about your emotions. Do, do other people perceive you as an emotional people, a, a, an emotional person, someone who keeps uh, changing emotions from one moment to the other? So this can be useful for you. And the last one, own your own actions. Take full responsibility for what you say and do. Be aware of what you think and how it turns into words and actions. So now we're going to do a very quick exercise to help you tune in with your uh, self-awareness. In this space, or for you, if you have at home, if you have some paper, pen and paper, try to write, I'm gonna give you one minute to write as many feelings as you can recall that you experienced during the last 24 hours. So for example, I can say, I remember during the last 24 hours, I was stressed, I was happy, I was hungry, I was, just try to remember. I give you one minute and then uh, each of you can write a few of them. Okay, instead of giving me examples, I think good, someone says uh, happy, bored, disappointed. Uh, okay, take that, you are aware of your angry behavior. Can you explain this example? 
So uh, what do you mean uh, with that? If uh, when you realize that you are angry, uh, you want, this is something that you should do. This is an exercise that you should do with yourself. Try to find uh, what were the things that led you to be angry. In this case, I saw that you wrote also examples of feelings, but also what you can tell me now, all of you, how many feelings, how many uh, emotions do you recall? How many did you write down? In this minute that I gave you, how many feelings did you write? Seven, good. Anyone more than seven? Seven is not bad for one minute. The problem with this exercise is that many times uh, it's difficult to go back to 24 hours and remember every minute what feelings I had because sometimes our feelings and our emotions change from one minute to the other. I can give you one tool by which I am sure if I give you an additional minute, you would be able to find instead of seven, you would be able to find 20, uh, 20 different feelings. How is it? It would be by guiding you and by giving examples because now you can think of feelings. Okay, how many feelings do I know? I know happy, I know sad, I know angry, I know hungry, I know... Okay, you can think like this. But if I give you this tool, this is the wheel of emotions. If I give you this tool from the beginning and I give you one minute, it would be much easier for you to identify your emotions. So this is a good exercise for your self-awareness. You can print this wheel. You can get it in one comfortable place. For example, every night before going to sleep, you have it next to your bed. You have this wheel, and then you go through some of the emotions. Did I feel surprised today? And my surprise was more about excitement, was more about amazement. Was it about being confused? Or was it about being startled because someone appeared from some place that I didn't expect? And then you can go even more in detail. If every day you do this exercise, you just use three minutes of your time, you look at this wheel and then you note down how many of these feelings you had and try to understand what made you feel that way, it would be very easy for you to be more in tune with your feelings. So this is just, uh, I will share, um, I guess uh, we will be able to share this presentation and you, you will be able to, share, uh, to use this wheel to understand you yourself better. Self-management is about managing these emotions that you already, uh, you already perceive and you already understand. The ability to use your awareness of your own emotions to stay flexible and positively direct your behavior. Try to make your behavior as positive as possible by knowing your own emotions. Managing your emotional reactions to also situations and people. We saw before that some situations and some people might trigger different emotions on you. Once you know this, you will be able to manage. You will be able to either avoid that people or avoid those situations. Or if you cannot avoid them, to try to uh, kind of uh, adapt your way of listening to them in a way that is not going to create negative emotions. Again, we have Plato, a philosopher from the Greek time, who said the first and best victory is to conquer ourselves. So once you can first understand yourself and manage yourself, you will be able to get better relationships. The next level is on the relationships, the social awareness, ability to accurately pick on emotions of other people, to understand what is really going on to understand what other people are thinking and feeling, even if you don't feel the same way. This is a very difficult task because you need to put yourself on the shoes of someone else. You need to understand how they're feeling or why they are acting on, an, on a specific way, even if you are not feeling the same way. If you were feeling the same way, it would be easier because, for example, if someone is shouting at a teacher in the class, and then you don't understand why, because maybe you don't feel anything wrong about the teacher, but maybe this person had some problems with the teacher. It could be some personal problems, or it could be some problems related to the grades he was given, etc. So this is something that we need to be open about. Social awareness is difficult because you always need to think of how people think and why they are behaving this way. 
Resolve to be tender with the young, compassionate with the aged, sympathetic with the striving, and tolerant with the weak and wrong. Sometime in your life, you will have been one uh, all of this. So don't think that, oh, these people are acting weird and I will never do this because I will never be in this position. You never know in which position you're going to be in your life or you don't remember sometimes in which position you were many years ago and you forgot because now you are in a better position. So try not to judge people on their behaviors before trying to understand them first. How to improve social awareness? So here it's something that gives you some clues about how we can become better at understanding other people and being more empathetic, as we mentioned before. Spend extra time observing, asking, and listening, especially with the people close to you. Observe what they do and try to ask and listen to the reasons why they are behaving this way and what are their explanations. And then try to um, understand that not everyone behaves and acts on the same way. Maintain eye contact because many times the words can be misleading. But when you are looking at someone at the eye, it's easier to understand how they are feeling as well. Give the speaker your full attention. When you are listening to someone, don't uh, take the telephone or be looking at something else or try to be thinking about what I'm going to prepare for dinner. When you are communicating with people, you need to give them full attention. This one is very important. Play back and summarize. And this one uh, works very well for leaders. Whenever one of your, employee, of your employees are telling you a problem, you need to summarize what they tell you before you uh, uh, ask or you make a decision. Did you mean, or by what you just say, do you mean that you feel this way because of this? And do you mean that if we change this, you're going to behave differently? You see, we are playing back and we are summarizing before making any decision. Try on their shoes. Try to put yourself on the situation of other people. Don't judge. This is something that we already mentioned. Words can be misleading, but body language is usually not misleading. So you need to be able to communicate. And that's why you need this. You need to give the speaker your full attention, not just listening, but also watching them. Try to understand emotions also in the tone of the speech. Many times the words can have a different meaning depending on the tone. The last one is relationship management. Relationship management is the ability to use awareness of the emotions, so social awareness, and the emotions of other people, your own emotions, sorry, uh, uh, self-awareness, and the emotions of other people, the social awareness, in order to manage interactions success successfully, in order to have successful relationships. We need to make sure that communication is clear, and we need to make sure that we handle conflicts effectively. We don't need to be scared of conflicts. We don't need to hide from conflicts, but we need to manage them properly. People are not good or bad. They are, and this is from Lemon Snicket, the writer of a series of unfortunate events. They are like chef salads. There are good things, there are bad things. Everything is chopped, everything is mixed, and there's a vinaigrette of confusion and conflict. So you cannot say, I understand this person 100%, or you cannot say this person is very good or this person is very bad. Each of us has a mix of different traits. In order to improve relationship management, we need to try to build high quality, high trust relationship, try to build trust in all your relationships, try to discover the emotions that are playing in your relationships with people, if you feel that there's some tension or there's some uh, emo emotional reactions when you are talking to someone, you can feel it because of the words they are saying. You can feel it because of their body language. You can feel it because of the tone that they are using. Try to ask them questions and try to understand why their emotions are changing. And the last thing, be quick to settle the disputes. If you leave a problem, um, leave it and say, okay, I'm gonna fix it later, then this is not gonna fix time, doesn't help to fix problems unless you act on them. So this is something important. When you have misunderstandings in the companies, with friends, with your family, you need to solve it as quick as possible by asking questions, by empathizing, and by communicating. So I think I managed well with the time.
So thank you very much for your attention. And now if you have any questions, either about the topics that we cover today very quickly or about the programs that we are offering, we are more than happy to answer. So thank you very much. Perfect. So hello again, everyone. And first of all, I want to thank um, our panelists, Dr. Jorge Annans, for his thorough and very interesting presentation. And I see here that we already have some questions actually from the participants. So I would like to remind everyone that there's still a little bit of time to ask questions. So if you want, you can do so by writing them here in the Q&A box. So I would say let's start with the first one, shall we? So first question is, what can I expect in terms of career opportunities and how can I present myself to companies after completing a master in leadership? And how can the skills acquired in this course be applied in the workplace and in which sectors could I specialize? Good, very good question. Thank you very much. So yes, actually our Master of Leadership, uh, when we were designing these masters, there were some people asking us, we are a hospitality business school. Why don't you call it Master of Hospitality Leadership? Uh, we thought that we have seen the trend in the last uh, few years that our students of hospitality, they are going into many other fields. Because now in all the industries, uh, there's a very important focus on the customer. And many companies, even if they are in totally different industries like banking, uh, real estate, consulting, they want uh, employees and leaders who can uh, relate to the customers and uh, provide a good customer experience. And that's why they believe that uh, students from hospitality schools, they have this advantage compared to other students. In terms of leadership and the skills that they can get, uh, there will be, uh, as I was mentioning before, we have reduced the amount of hours for the coursework for the theoretical contents, and we have increased the amount of practical workshops, seminars, and even trips that will be working on the soft skills of the students. And these soft skills are what really uh, make or break a, le a, de a leader. If you want to be a good leader, you need to have these soft skills. So this Master of Leadership will give you possibilities in all sectors, all different sectors, but uh, the employers will know that you have the skills to be a leader and mainly focus on these soft skills on how to manage people. Perfect, thank you so much. So. Next question is, do you think someone who's more of an introvert can uh, can still reach a managerial position? Definitely. I was an introvert. I can say I'm now a bit less introvert, but when I was at school, when I was at my bachelor, I remember having to do presentations in front of people and I would try to find ways, I would try to convince the lecturers, can I uh, record a video of myself and put the video in the class instead of me presenting? Uh, after some time and then after learning some, in my case, were some meditation techniques before presentation, it, will, it helped me becoming more, I was an introvert in terms of uh, my relationship with individuals one-on-one, -on -one, but I was introvert in terms of talking to a big group of people. Uh, definitely, uh, good leaders uh, can be, it doesn't affect if you are an introvert. Some people, they are keeping an introvert in the personal life and then they become extrovert in their professional lives only because it's what they need to do in order to uh, reach their personal goals, professional goals, and the goals of the organization. So yes, you just need to work on your skills, but for sure you can be. Great, thank you so much for your answer. So next question is from Gustavo and he says, hi, what is your personal approach to leading a team through challenging situations? Good. Uh, again, the first thing is uh, I like the word challenging. I always try to change the word difficult to the word challenging because difficult is a negative uh, perspective of the same uh, the same topic. Uh, challenging is something positive. When you have a challenge, it's something that will make you improve, will make you change, and will make you uh, become a better you in order to overcome that challenge. Uh, what I do, of course, depending on the challenge, there are different actions, but my general approach is to first understand the challenge, uh, see uh, who would be the members of my team that need to put a, a more of an input on the challenge, depending on their characteristics, the characteristics, depending on their behaviors, depending on the way they work. Uh, different challenges uh, need the action of different people. 
So putting the right people to the right challenge and also being very open uh, in the communication, not trying to hide information about the challenge, not trying to kind of sweeten the challenge so that people don't feel that it's going to be a, a situation that it, it can present some difficulties in their day-to-day -day work. Uh, but in a way that we need to keep a positive attitude, we can make it together, I will be here to support and uh, choosing the right people for the right challenge, I would say is the main thing. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you so much for your answer. So another question is, um, how do you properly handle uh, co conflicts or disagreements within a team? Good. Again, as I said before, it's very important not to hide from conflicts or not to avoid conflicts. If a conflict is there and you uh, leave it stagnate, it's going to just grow bigger and there's going to be a moment that is going to burst. So the most important thing is listening, asking questions by communication. Communication is the key. And it would be effective communication, not just uh, sending an email or not just uh, kind of... Uh, threatening people by saying, you need to solve this problem by tomorrow, uh, you need to reach an agreement if there's a conflict between two employees, for example, but by a kind of being in the middle, uh, trying to arbitrate the conflict, but not by making that decision on yourself if you are the leader. If there's a conflict between two employees, you need to be kind of the person in the middle, the referee, we can say in a sports term, you need to listen to both parties and you need to let them find the right solution that would be a, a solution that would be positive for both of the parties. Great, thank you so much. And now moving on to some different types of questions. We have another one from one of our spectators that says, hello, what are the requirements to apply? Uh, meaning which documents do I need to submit? And do I need to have a specific bachelor to be eligible? Perfect. So I can uh, I can take this other set of uh, of questions on uh, admission and enrollment. So for this master specifically, the Master of Science in Leadership, students should of course already have a bachelor degree, a bachelor of arts, a bachelor of science in a management related field. This is usually what what we required. Um, previous professional experience is but it's not mandatory, so it could help in the selection process, but it's not a strict requirement. Uh, and then apart from that, for those students who have not completed their bachelor in English, in this case, we'd also need an English uh, certification. It could be IELTS, TOEFL, or a Cambridge exam. Uh, just to give you a reference for the IELTS, the minimum required level is 6.0. Um, or the equivalent of other, other certifications. So the documents that really need to be um, submitted are the uh, bachelor's um, diploma um, certificate, the transcripts uh, from the uh, from the degree, again the English certification, passport copy, um, the normal required uh, documents that uh, I'm sure most of you have also used to apply for your bachelor degree. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much, Gaia. So next question is, do you offer scholarship? And if so, how do I apply? Um, so our uh, application process is quite straightforward. Again, the documents that we require are the ones that we just mentioned. The application is done directly online with the support of your enrollment advisor. It could be me, it could be one of my, of my colleagues. We are private institutions, but we do have some scholarships available. They could be given either as financial aid and support, or uh, mainly what we give are merit-based scholarships. Now, whenever I mention merit-based scholarships, students, sometimes they get a little bit scared because they ask, oh, do I need a minimum grade? Are there any specific um, grade requirements that I should fulfill? Um, we focus a lot on soft skills. Uh, and on attitude, as most probably you have understood from uh, from this uh, master class. So we don't necessarily strictly look at grades uh, because they don't tell us much about the student, but we also look at the application documents holistically. We ask for a motivational letter. In certain cases, we do motivational interviews. So merit-based scholarships, they're really given on merit uh, following the uh, 
uh, following our uh, knowledge of the person of the students, what is their background, what do they wish to achieve with this master. So scholarships, they are given uh, based on this. Perfect. Thank you so much. And we also have another uh, question regarding uh, the accommodation. So do you uh, offer accommodation? Um, absolutely, we do. And uh, if you don't mind, maybe reading also the next question, Alessandra will answer them both at the same time because they're very linked. Absolutely. So the question is, sorry, <laughs> what's the cost of the master's and what does it cover? Okay, so basically, um, the uh, our master program, um, we uh, refer to it as an all-inclusive program. So after the uh, webinar, I guess that the uh, attendees will receive an email with the link to the brochure and all of that. So you will find all of this information on the brochure and on the website too. I will also then send you an email with all of this, just to recap. But uh, our costs are all inclusive, meaning that they do not cover any tuition costs, but they also cover accommodation. Uh, in this case, the master is delivered in our um, Greek campus, so it's in the German speaking part of Switzerland, and the accommodation it's only a few minutes walk from the university center. All students have single rooms in our Brick campus. Meals are also uh, included uh, in the package. So um, they're offered during the, the week. Uh, and then on weekends, students, they have kitchen facilities available for them, uh, for them to cook. Health insurance is included. All learning material is, uh, is included. Um, all the permit expenses as well, administrative costs, they are included in the, uh, in the fees. And then again, we will send you the link to the fees after the presentation. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much, Guy, and also thank you so much, Jorge, because that was our last question. So again, before we say goodbye, um, I want to thank uh, everyone connected with us today for being so active and for asking all of the questions and thank our panelists for their presentation and for answering all of the questions. So I would like to remind everyone interested in receiving a certificate of attendance by DocCity that they can do so by clicking on the link that I'm sending right now in the chat and uh, you just need to click on it to request it. So, uh, and also remind everyone that uh, in the following days, you will receive an email with the link to the recording of this webinar and also all the relevant contact information to get in touch uh, with the uh, university. So before we say goodbye, I would like to ask our panelists if they would like to leave our participants with a short final message. So I would like to say again, thank you very much for joining us. And then uh, I really hope if you have any other questions, you need more information about the program, about the academic side of the program, feel free to contact me. You can find on the website my email information of the CSRH College. And yes, I wish you a very nice evening. Yeah, that's it from my side. Thank you. Okay, so thanks again to our speakers and everyone connected with us today. And I hope to see you again uh, in the next webinar organized by DocCity. So bye and have a nice rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye.